Okay, so uh, your audience is going to be walking in while you're speaking, and we want to welcome uh, to a uh, talk called Artificial Intelligence and Telecommunications. Uh, this is Anne Lee of Nokia. She's a Bell Labs Technology Vision and a Bell Labs Fellow. So without further ado, welcome Anne. Thank you. Okay. okay, so hello everyone. How many of you have seen the rapper Common on TV doing a commercial about artificial intelligence? Maybe you don't know who rap. You, you have, okay, great. <laughs> it's the Microsoft commercial, in case you don't know who uh, Common is. Uh, and how many of you have watched channels like CNBC or Bloomberg TV and listened to financial analysts talk about artificial intelligence? These are just a few indications that AI has gone mainstream. Okay. Now let's see what leaders are saying about AI. First, Risto Silisma. He's the chairman of Nokia's board. And recently he said that the introduction of smart technologies like 5G, cloud services, artificial intelligence, and blockchain will open completely new possibilities for companies. Andrew Ng said that AI is the new electricity. Andrew Ng is one of the high profile leaders in the AI field. He had been the director of the Stanford University AI Lab. He was the co-founder and leader of the Google Brain Project when it created a breakthrough neural network that was able to learn and recognize images of cats. He is the co-founder of the well-known book Coursera, but what he may be most famous for is his Stanford University machine learning class. This class has been the most popular class on campus and is also available online. Now, Fei-Fei Li is currently the director of the Stanford University AI Lab and had been the AI chief scientist for Google Cloud. She said, as one of the leaders in the world for AI, I feel tremendous excitement and responsibility to create the most awesome and benevolent technology for society. Dr. Li is famous for creating the ImageNet database, which has been key to breakthroughs in image recognition technology. Fei-Fei Li is also co-founder of an organization called AI for All, whose goal is to bring more women and minorities into the field. Sundar Pichai, he's the CEO of Google, and he stated that AI is probably the most important thing humanity has ever worked on. And finally, Melinda Gates. She's a strong supporter of diversity and inclusion in artificial intelligence. And she said, if we're going to create AI that works for all people, we need a diverse group of people building it. AI and machine learning are going to change our world. It's up to us to make sure that change is for the better. Now, on the government side, nations around the world are working on plans for a future with artificial intelligence. As an example, earlier this year in March, the G7 countries met in Montreal to discuss the topic of preparing for jobs of the future. Three key points came out of the meeting. One is that AI will touch and transform every sector and every industry, and it will help society address the most challenging problems. Second, AI is expected to generate trillions of dollars in the global economy annually by as early as 2030. And third, G7 members shined a spotlight on increasing trust and adoption of AI and promoting inclusivity in AI development and deployment. Here in the United States, a two-hour congressional hearing was held in June of this year on the topic of the power of artificial intelligence. This hearing was recorded and is available on YouTube. One of the major concerns discussed at this meeting was the impact of AI on people's jobs and lives. Technology disruptors have created major shifts and transformations in the way people live throughout history. Let's look right now at the more recent technology-based revolutions. In the 90 years between 1760 and 1850, the loom, the steam engine, and iron making were key innovations that drove what we now call the first industrial revolution. 
This era saw society move from being agrarian-based, where the majority of people lived and worked on farms, to being factory-based, where the majority of people lived and worked in cities. Then from 1880 to 1920, more disruptive inventions transformed people's lives and livelihoods further. The one that's nearest and dearest to our hearts is the telephone. But at the same time, electricity became pervasive and automobiles replaced the horse and buggy. This was the second industrial revolution. The third industrial revolution, called the digital revolution, was really made possible by Bell Labs' invention of the transistor in 1947. The transistor is what made computing power ubiquitous today. And between the internet and computers at work, and in our homes and on our phones, the lives of people now are radically different from just 30 or 40 years ago. We are now at the beginning of the fourth industrial revolution. And technology leaders all agree that the speed of technology advancements is increasing. The number and diversity of technology advancements in this new era is also numerous, with artificial intelligence being one of the key pillars driving change forward. The artificial intelligence field is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. This is according to one of the founders of the field, John McCarthy. Within the AI field is a subfield called machine learning. Machine learning is the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. For those of you who are coders, imagine if you had to write a traditional program that, had, that could recognize images of cats. How would you do this? It's very challenging, right? To solve problems like recognizing cats, a paradigm shift was required. Rather than hard coding images of every type of cat at every possible angle that a cat could be seen in, we need a software, sorry, We need software that could learn what cats look like and recognize new images of cats that had never encountered before. This has been made possible by machine learning. And one of the most promising subfields of machine learning is deep learning. Much of deep learning today is based on a category of algorithms called neural networks. In 1955, four technology giants of that era co-authored a proposal for a new research project called Artificial Intelligence. This project began the following summer in 1956 at the inaugural Dartmouth College AI Conference. John McCarthy from Dartmouth College coined the term Artificial Intelligence, and the other three co-founders were Marvin Minsky from Harvard University, Nathaniel Rochester from IBM, and Claude Shannon from Bell Labs. The foundational technologies that underlie and make up artificial intelligence starts at the hardware layer. Machine learning algorithms were first run on CPUs, and for some of them, including neural networks, this confined them to the research labs due to the limitations of CPU processing power. The advent of GPUs for gaming a few years ago also helped to unleash artificial intelligence into the market. Finally, there was enough processing power to drive the more complex AI algorithms. The emerging success of AI use cases then led to the creation of neuromorphic chips and the use of FPGAs. The expectation is that when quantum computing becomes available, this will help to advance AI even further. The next layer of AI foundational building blocks are the algorithms and the data that's used to, for the algorithms to learn or train on. Some examples of machine learning algorithms are support vector machines, Bayesian networks, genetic algorithms, decision trees, and neural networks. There are currently four primary methods of training the algorithms to create models. Training is how the algorithms actually learn. The four methods are supervised learning, where samples of known labeled data are used, unsupervised learning, where the training data are unlabeled and patterns or clusters are identified, Semi-supervised learning, which uses both labeled and unlabeled data, and reinforcement learning, which creates models where the objective of the algorithm is to minimize or maximize the value of some predefined goal or reward. These algorithms stand alone or in combination with each other, 
form AI building blocks that can perform an intelligent task. And these tasks include computer vision, natural language processing, locomotion for robots, game theory, and influence maximization. These AI building blocks can then be used to create AI applications. These AI applications can assist humans, augment humans with superpowers, or work independently alongside humans. Since the formalization of the artificial intelligence field in 1956, AI has gone through a number of springs and winters. The advancement of the field depended on the advancement of three major areas. First is hardware. Neural networks were invented decades ago, but have been stuck in research labs for as many years until GPUs came along. Increasing compute power has been vital to the progress of AI and some of its algorithms such as neural networks. Second is data. Current AI algorithms require massive amounts of training data to learn. And data has not been plentiful until recently. With the development of cheaper and denser data storage, along with the proliferation of data output from an expansive number of data sources, machine learning has become more and more routine. And third is software. AI software has evolved from expert systems with programmed intelligence to self-learning algorithms and the emergence of automated software generation. We are now in the midst of a perfect storm where hardware data and software have advanced sufficiently to propel artificial intelligence forward, driving the fourth industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence has broad applicability. So before I talk about the use of AI in telecommunications, let's see how it's used in other fields. The goals of AI algorithms are learning, prediction, perception, language understanding, operation in the physical world, reasoning, and decision making. These, these example applications that I'm going to talk about accomplish one or more of these goals. Some of them are already in the market, while others are emerging. The self-driving car is one of the emerging AI apps that we're all very well aware of. Computer vision and locomotion are just a couple of the AI building blocks that are used here. Robotics is another area being enhanced by AI. General purpose robots especially can now be trained for one task and then later retrained for another task. Robots do not have to be purpose built to do just one or a handful of jobs. In the legal field, AI tools are available to do assisted e-discovery looking for electronic evidence that can be used in the litigation of a case. This evidence includes emails, documents, presentations, databases, voicemail, audio and video files, social media, and websites. In the past, the discovery process meant a lot of late nights going through filing cabinets and reading stacks of memos, receipts, invoices, and other paperwork generated in the course of normal business. But today, most of those records are digitized, so given this, AI can be a valuable assistant to help in the discovery process. We are all familiar with Siri and Alexa, right? Chatbots and virtual assistants are obvious AI applications that continue to mature while also already are out in the marketplace. In the medical field, there is lots of excitement and anticipation in the air of how AI can transform the field and exponentially improve both diagnosis as well as treatment of diseases. Great promise has already been shown in using AI for identifying certain cancers in MRI and CAT scans, for example. The dream is for a future of automated diagnosis and personalized medicine. Today there are AI agents that can prepare, generate, and write reports. The New York Times, Washington Post, Reuters, BBC, and the Associated Press are just a few news publications that use AI to produce news content for their readers. In addition, they use AI for engagement with their content as well. An example is the use of AI agents to moderate comments. AI, as with other technologies, can be used for both good and bad. Nowhere is that clearer than in the area of cybersecurity. Hackers can use AI to break into systems, while cyber defenses can use AI to stop hackers. Escalation on both sides are expected to be perpetual and ongoing as a part of a world based heavily on technology. 
Search and recommendation engines are used by most people on a daily basis. They are some of the very early applications of AI. And then there are games, such as The Sims, that use AI. These are just a few examples of the fields that are using AI today. As many people and organizations have been expressing more and more, artificial intelligence will touch and transform every sector and every industry, helping humans solve our most challenging problems. Now let's look briefly on the investment side. A market study found that in 2016, AI startups was the fastest growing investment area in the US with $9 billion. With respect to established companies, the obvious players are Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon. But big telecommunications providers are also investing. This includes AT&T, Verizon, and Vodafone. And according to market research firm IDC, by this year, 2018, 75% of developers will be building AI into their apps. One of the major concerns that people express when it comes to AI is if AI will replace human workers. Looking back at history, new disruptive technologies have always had an impact on jobs. However, for as many jobs that are displaced, many more have been created. In the case of artificial intelligence, Let's look at the intelligence of machines in comparison to the intelligence of humans. Machines are good at speed, accuracy, repetition, prediction, and scalability. Machines don't have to eat, take bathroom breaks, or sleep. But humans still have a higher order of intelligence. Human strengths are in creativity, improvisation, dexterity, social and leadership skills. AI will definitely impact work but not necessarily in how we might assume. Rather than replacing workers, in many situations, AI will make human workers more productive and do their work better. In fact, researchers at MIT in partnership with BMW determined that human-machine collaboration was 85% more productive than either humans or machines working alone. Now let's dive into the topic of AI and telecommunications. Why do we want to incorporate AI into communication systems? The key to this answer is not the question of want, but the question of need. As networks become more and more complex to serve more and more sophisticated services, the ability of humans to manually maintain them and the cost of supporting these networks become untenable. For telecom, AI will be addressing large spatial temporal problems. Artificial intelligence, therefore, is not optional. And telco AI investment trends show that service providers recognize this. There are four areas where AI can be applied in telecommunications. The first is in operations. Both intranetwork element and internetwork element management of resources, handling of faults, and system security are becoming increasingly complex. At the same time, technology advances are making it possible for real-time dynamic optimization of these functions. So with AI, resources and configuration parameters will no longer take months to engineer. Dynamic allocation and configuration will be possible. With AI, root cause analysis and diagnosis of faults can happen faster with systems becoming increasingly more self-healing. In fact, in some cases, it will be possible to predict when a fault will occur before it happens, enabling the system or a human engineer to take preventive actions, reducing system downtime significantly. And with AI, security breaches can be identified as they happen with immediate defensive actions taken to protect the system. For some complex scenarios, Multi-agent coordination across various operations functions within a network element will be required. In other complex scenarios, multi-agent coordination may be required across multiple network elements. Real-time optimization is also becoming increasingly important, especially as we move to 5G networks. AI can automate and optimize spectrum sharing, carrier aggregation, massive MIMO uh, beam selection, handover decisions, parameter tuning, load balancing, multi-optimization, and WAN path selection. 
These optimizations could trigger actions like the deactivation of power amplifiers and batching of latency and sensitive transmissions. By using AI, continuous real-time retuning can result in optimizing the usage of the least amount of resources, maximizing QoS, QoE, maximizing throughput per user, and minimizing required manual intervention. AI can also be applied to subscriber-focused features. These features support the goals of subscriber acquisition and retention, customer experience, and context-aware applications. Strategies to acquire and retain subscribers can be aided by AI through subscriber insights, churn prediction, application and content recommendations, service personalization, new feature identification, zero-touch automated new customer enrollment, and existing customer modification workflows. Artificial intelligence, including chatbots and virtual assistants that are trained very specifically for the telecom network, can provide a new level of sophisticated support from the contact center. This includes troubleshooting, new service enrollment, billing, and general inquiries from existing and potential new subscribers. And a new generation of subscriber applications is made possible by AI. And this includes context-aware applications, chatbots, intelligent video surveillance, translation services, virtual personal assistance, and much more. On the vendor side, AI is not only important to be integrated into its products and solutions, as we've just described, but AI can assist in research and development, in sales contracts and customer support, and in continuing education for its employees. Tools are emerging to aid in AI solution development in the areas of automated model selection, hyperparameters tuning, and feature engineering. There are tools like AutoML or AutoCaris that helps with automating and assisting in AI model creation tasks like pre-processing and cleaning of data, selecting and constructing appropriate features, selecting an appropriate model family, optimizing model hyperparameters, post-processing machine learning models, and critically analyzing the results that are obtained. All of these tools are implemented with reinforcement learning and evolutionary algorithms. In other words, AI is used to help create AI solutions. This can reduce the time it takes to develop a solution as well as minimize the expertise that's required. AI tools can also be used to find defects and security holes in code before the software is actually released in the field. <clears throat> Artificial intelligence can also help in automating a wide variety of tasks in various parts of vendor processes. This can include document generation, automated RFX responses, streamlining of the executive contract approval workflow, and assisting human technicians in troubleshooting. And AI can also be used to improve the education process for employees. There are emerging technologies in or related to the artificial intelligence field that are applicable to telecommunications. So let's talk about a number of them now. First, reinforcement learning. Re reinforcement learning is one of four primary learning and training methods for AI. It's not new, but as with other AI innovations, it has not been able to take off until very recently. It was in 2016 that Google DeepMind's AlphaGo defeated one of the top Go players in the world. And Go is considered one of the more difficult games for computers to win against human beings, even using traditional AI techniques. The AlphaGo win reawakened interest in reinforcement learning. The way reinforcement learning works is that algorithms are directed to tune their hyperparameters in the training process to maximize or minimize a reward goal. That has profound implications for key use case categories. This method is very, a very natural and obvious fit for AI usage in control systems. And in telecommunications, our networks are the epitome of control systems. Some obvious reward goals that AI agents for telecom systems could reach for include maximizing QoS attributes, minimizing faults, and minimizing resource or energy usage. 
Go is a two-player game, and AI success in beating humans in Go is only the beginning in this new spring for reinforcement learning. Reinforcement research is now demonstrating success in multi-agent coordination for multiplayer team games using reinforcement learning. And again, this has positive implications for non-gaming use cases. In telecom, a multitude of AI agents will exist across the network. In some cases, a number of these agents could pursue competing reward goals that conflict with each other. For example, minimizing energy usage might conflict with maximizing QoS. In other cases, a number of agents might need to work together to reach a conclusion, such as in root cause analysis and fault prediction and prevention. So an increase in traffic, for example, might mean an event has occurred and people want to communicate with each other, or an increase in traffic could mean that there's a denial of service attack, or an increase in traffic could mean that there's a fault in the system. Advances in multi-agent coordination can help automate the root cause analysis for these issues, and self-healing could be possible for these use cases with reinforcement learning. Now data is a key element in artificial intelligence. It's well known that with today's algorithms, training requires a huge number of data samples. This creates a couple of problems. First is access to a large data set. Most companies have challenges here. Secondly, training with huge data sets takes a great deal of time. So research is pursuing a number of different potential solutions. One shot and few shot learning tries to mimic human learning. Notice how a young child does not require seeing thousands of images of cats in order to learn what a cat is. Algorithms that can do the same will solve the data problem. In the meantime, generative adversarial networks, or GANs, are being considered for the creation of more data from existing data. There are different ways in which new accurate data can be created rather than collected. If we just consider image data, for example, Images can be rotated, flipped, 3D versions can be developed from 2D, existing 2D images, all of this to generate more sample data for training. And blockchain is another solution that can open up access to data that's currently restricted to a few. Jeffrey Hinton, who's responsible for introducing backpropagation to neural networks is currently working on a new neural network called capsule networks. From a computer vision perspective, capsule networks incorporate more detailed parameters that characterize the relationship between objects in an image. The claim is that by doing this, capsule networks only need a fraction of the data required by traditional neural networks. As with CNNs, that were originally applied to image-based use cases, but easily expanded to non-image cases, capsule networks might be able to do the same. Transparency, trust, and integrity are ongoing issues in AI that are actively discussed and being worked. Many of us are familiar with the black box dilemma of current AI solutions. While we may understand how AI algorithms work, even the developers of AI solutions cannot always explain why their AI agents arrive at the conclusions that they come to. For reasons including safety and fairness, this situation is not acceptable. Even governments are beginning to weigh in. For example, the EU recently began implementing its GDPR, General Data Protection Regulations, protecting personal data. This may make the collection of data for training more difficult and if personal data is used to make automated decisions about people, companies will have to be able to explain how that decision was made. AI cannot be black boxes. In the US DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency is working on an AI explainability toolkit. This toolkit is still in progress and not yet available. But the goal is to help make it possible for AI agents to explain why they reached the conclusions that they did. In the meantime, disclosing data sources and the algorithms that they use are ways to start to explain the actions of an AI. To address potentially biased results from an AI, data audits and algorithm audits can be conducted and when available, 
explainability should mitigate bias from AI solutions. And finally, from the perspective of integrity, highly publicized experiments have shown that even undetectable perturbations of the input data can throw an AI wildly off course with very unexpected and erroneous results. Research is now looking into denoiser solutions as well as better ways to regularize the algorithms to address adversarial attacks. We've looked briefly at the dependency that AI success has had on the hardware layer. Moore's law, as we've known it, is coming to an end. It's hitting the laws of physics wall, reaching physical limits at the molecular level. There are only three shrinks left, meaning three doubling of transistor density. To continue to make advances beyond Moore's law, we need a principled scientific process for fast coding. At MIT, a study was done on the performance of 4K by 4K matrix multiplication using different programming languages and coding techniques. Four lines of Python code took seven hours to complete the multiplication. With assembly language and various coding techniques like parallelization and vectorization, the time to complete could be brought down from seven hours to 0.38 seconds. This is all without new hardware. But it makes coding much more complex than the four lines of Python code. So how can this process be simplified? That's what ongoing research is looking at. On a related front, significant I.O. speed improvements in networks and interfacing to mass storage is still progressing forward, but improvements in CPU clock speed has stopped. To fully take advantage of the I.O. speed improvements, new OS architectures are needed that includes bypassing of the kernel. Other interesting research in AI that can impact the telecommunications industry include AI enabling the physical layer. So for example, for transmitters and receivers in channel coding and compression. Work is also continuing in various ways to automate programming, and that includes neural guided deductive search. And researchers are working on implementing neural networks by 3D printing an optical neural network that operates on light rather than electrons. It improves on speed and energy e efficiency. These are all research areas that can potentially be applied to telecommunications. Now let's return to the question of the impact of AI on, on work. Earlier this year, the book Human Plus Machine, Reimagining Work in the Age of AI was released. This book looks at the question of what is the impact of artificial intelligence on jobs. The final segment of my talk is gonna focus on the key points from this book. Science fiction has painted a picture of AI taking over the world. While many people don't believe that this view has any merit anytime soon, there are many people who do worry that AI may take, enough, take over enough of a large percentage of jobs that it could wreak havoc on economic and social stability. The Human and Machine book argues that rather than eliminating jobs, AI will transform jobs. The future is a world of humans collaborating with machines as opposed to humans being dominated by machines. This new collaboration model is what the book calls the missing middle. It outlines three ways in which humans will complement machines and three ways in which AI will give humans superpowers. And these six approaches are what make up the missing middle. With the advent of artificial intelligence, three new job categories will arise due to the nature of AI. The first are trainers. AI software and robots will need to be trained and retrained over time. There will need to be human workers who will collect, organize, and clean the relevant data for training. There will need to be workers who train AI agents to be empathetic, to understand human idiosyncrasies like sarcasm, and to understand the local culture in which they're working. This is especially going to be important as AI agents increasingly become the face of a company's brand. Human workers will also need to be explainers of AI. As we said before, AI is currently a black box. Even developers can have trouble explaining why their AI came to conclusions that they did. Due to business, legal, and regulatory implications, it's important for business leaders to understand what their AI agents are doing and why. Humans can work as algorithm forensics and transparency analysts 
to address this need. And third, human workers are needed as sustainers. These people work on safety, ethics, and contextual design. For example, self-driving cars can easily learn the rules of the road for any region of any country, but what's harder is knowing when to break the rules. For instance, a solid white line may mean that a car should not cross over it. However, if crossing over it avoids a collision, then the rules should be broken. Human workers are required to teach AI these common sense use cases and rules. Artificial intelligence can also give humans superpowers. Rather than take their jobs away, AI helps humans do their jobs better. There are three ways it can do this. First is through amplification. AI can give people extraordinary data-driven insights. The amount of data that can be generated now and is going to be generated in the future can be extremely useful, but can be also very overwhelming. Humans need tools to manage the data and extract the insights. AI can help here. Examples of existing solutions that already use AI to amplify humans include Autodesk's Dreamcatcher, which is a generative software application for industrial design. Stitch Fix has a wardrobe recommendations engine. Comatica has a molecular predictions engine. And then there's smart augmented reality glasses. Second, AI improves human interactions. Advanced user interfaces includes chatbots and virtual assistants, but they also include intelligent screens that can automatically display relevant results as a human worker progresses through their workflow. For example, Illumio is an app that aids radiologists in analyzing images by automatically displaying relevant lab results and then suggesting tool sets to use for those results. And third is physical augmentation of humans. Examples are collaborative robots or cobots, AI-enabled exoskeletons, and even AI implants for the human body. AI will change the nature of existing work, and in turn, processes around work will also need to be reimagined. The Human and Machine book highlights five principles that companies must adopt in order to be successful in incorporating artificial intelligence. The five principles are called MELDs. The first is mindset. Companies must change their approach to work and business with AI in mind. Second is experimentation. Companies must continuously look for opportunities to try AI, test AI, and scale AI. Third is leadership. Companies must make a commitment to the responsible use of AI from the start. Fourth is data. Companies must build a data supply chain to fuel their AI agents now and into the future. And fifth is skills. Companies must actively develop in their people the eight fusion skills, which we're going to describe next. The eight fusion skills focus on the strengths that humans have over machines and leveraging them in collaboration with AI. This includes allowing AI to handle the repetitious mundane tasks in order to free humans up for interpersonal interactions and creativity, something that many physicians and their patients would likely appreciate, for example. It also includes developing skills to know when and how to intercede when an AI is performing suboptimally or is uncertain as to what to do next. Human workers will have to learn how to best query an AI in order to get the insights that's truly useful and valuable for their project. And in general, humans need to learn how to best work with AI agents for it to be able to extend people's human capabilities. Humans will have to learn how to both teach the AI agents skills as well as for people to learn how to work in an AI-enhanced environment. And finally, humans have to learn skills to continuously create and evolve completely new AI-centered processes and business models. Disruptive technologies, innovations, and inventions have transformed the way people live and work throughout human history. Most recently, the transistor ultimately brought about the digital revolution, introducing computing and the internet into every sector and industry of society, creating new product solutions, services, and business models. Artificial intelligence is driving the fourth industrial revolution. AI alone, and in combination with other emerging technologies in the physical, digital, and biological domains, will also bring about profound changes in the way people will live and work. AI will not only accelerate automation, but the automation will go beyond human capabilities enabling solutions that were only dreamed of in science fiction books and movies. 
And in closing, artificial intelligence will also have profound impacts in the telecommunications industry. Just 30 years ago, nobody had a mobile phone, let alone a smartphone. Today, there are over 6 billion mobile phones in the world. Technological advances are accelerating, so stop and imagine what AI and communications could look like 30 years from now. Thank you for your time and attention. I guess we have some time for Q&A or... Hi, this is Jim from at and uh, I have one question regarding um, the um, using reinforcement learning in telecommunication. Because in telecom, we would normally want stability. But reinforcement learning agent can be brittle or erratic. So, for example, if I were using policy gradient to, to train the model, so our sort of end goal for each episode would be just to win that episode. But, you know, for each step, going to the end of the episode, it can be like, doing things like this, but this would not be a good behavior for telecom uh, equipment. So that would be a concern. So pl please correct me if I'm not yeah. understanding correctly. So. Right. So I think it also depends on use cases uh -huh. that you're utilizing um, the, the learning for um, and, and how you do the training, right? Mm -hmm. Because you could do training uh, in real time but you can also do training um, offline, right, as opposed to online. And I think that um, offline training probably makes more sense for, you know, most cases. And um, reinforcement learning is also a way in which you can uh, train a model without requiring uh, label data necessarily which is very difficult to, to, you know, can be difficult to obtain. Sure. So, um, so reinforcement learning, being able to um, reach for a goal of, for example, um, maximizing quality of service or minimizing faults or minimizing energy usage seems a very natural fit as opposed to trying to figure out or, or even create label data in order to reach those types of goals. I think it depends on the, yeah, the, the I, case, Yeah, because I came too. to this question because I, I saw a tutorial from Andre Carpathy, who yeah. is actually a very good tutor about deep learning on his yeah. blog. He actually has a demo of playing Pong using reinforcement learning. Pong is like yeah. you're going to bounce back the ball. Because, right. you know, a good behavior would be like, up, down, very slowly, and then you just you know look at the ball and just bounce it back. But in his reinforcement reinforcement learning implementation, the the thing is like doing this kind of thing, and yeah. it's really not what a human would do. So, yeah. so I wouldn't like that kind of behavior in the telecom right, uh, right. equipment. So. <laughs> I think we we need to be careful too to look at w which use cases in a telecom s system does this make sense for, right? Uh -huh. um, in, in games, you're going very fast and making decisions very fast. In some cases in, in telecom, you might be making quick decisions. Um, but today, a lot of decisions that actually aren't made quickly, right? You, you, you over-engineer because you don't know when you're going to have the spike in traffic. So you over-engineer for that, and, and you always have it. If we get to a point where we want to be... Um, more efficiently using our resources and reducing our capex, then we might be making more quick decisions and doing more dynamic uh, resource allocation. Yes, in that case, you might think a little bit about you know which training do you want to use for for that case. So I think it's a case by case basis, but I think that there's a lot of promise in reinforcement learning yeah, for right. for control systems like Thank telecom you. networks. There was, I thought there was one there too. I think there is absolutely no question about all the positives and the productivity improvement and the jobs that will be created. 
because of the artificial intelligence. But if you look at the survey of the thought leaders and the influencers in this arena, they are not so sure about whether the jobs which are created will exceed or equal the jobs which are eliminated. In fact, the split is almost 50-50 if you look at that, right? Uh -huh. So we can talk about how many jobs are created, but unless you have a model which says that that will exceed the jobs which are lost, I think it's hard to come to a conclusion that you know seems to come across, right? And maybe sure. we should use an artificial intelligence-based <laughs> tool to calculate that. Such a, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if if you use an artificial intelligence tool and you and you trained it with historical data, then you'll see that it, from history, first in, first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution, the third industrial revolution, they created a lot of new jobs, right? So I would imagine that. Um, this is going to create a lot of new jobs that um, we may not be able to imagine what they are today because I think there's many problems in the world that we don't even bother trying to solve today because we know there's no way to solve them because we don't have the tools right now to solve them. But if we had AI, can we relook at those problems and, and say, well, maybe we can solve them now with these new tools, which we just ignored before or we... If you just look at uh, medicine, for example, there's many diseases that we, we can't solve. I think we're increasingly realizing that people's bodies are all unique, and so more of a personalized medicine approach might work better uh, going forward. But how do you do that unless you had tools like AI to be able to, to customize for specific people? And, and you can think beyond medicine. Everything can be customized for a specific person in the future, right? Um, rather than, the, you know, we went through with the Industrial Revolution, the first and second Industrial Revolution of mass production, where you have even your clothes are mass produced, so there's certain, um, and rather than tailored for each person, that um, you have certain sizes. And then you fit uh, yourself to the size that's closest to you, right? But it's not tailored to you. In the future, everything may be tailorable to you, right? Imagine houses in the future. You may, everybody may be able to create their own unique houses, 3D print them, and it may be doable in a really uh, reasonable time frame someday. It's not doable today, but maybe in the future it may be as the technology continues to progress forward. Yeah. Into jobs. Yeah. To be able to do all of that, I think you do need workers. So they, you, the education for those workers may be higher than for jobs from previous industrial revolutions. But I, I tend to be a little more optimistic. Um, you, if you want to be pessimistic, you could also think that these technologies could create a lot of havoc in, this, in society, especially like in cybersecurity. And then you're going to need a lot of people working on solutions to combat <laughs> the bad actors that will be using the technology in a bad way. So there's going to be a lot of jobs from that perspective. The, you know, cybersecurity today is, uh, has zero unemployment, right? Because they can't get enough people that are, uh, have the background to fill those jobs. And you can, and you can't even solve the problems that are being caused by bad actors today in cybersecurity. So there's jobs out there. We just can't fill them. We don't have people. There's no, there aren't people that exist that have the skill set to, to solve those problems right now. And those are problems that need to be solved now, not, not the uh, customized housing that people would like to have. <laughs> But there are certain jobs that you, we really do need. I mean, some catastrophe could, could occur sometime soon. I, I was in a, um, uh, another uh, uh, presentation at a different conference where the person was talking about drones. And drones are exciting, yet you can just imagine the problems that can occur. And some people are surprised at the fact that we haven't had those incidents yet with drones. But there's no way to 
we're, we're working in communications to find ways to control these drones. So one idea is to have all these drones register into a communications network, for example, or some kind of network, just like mobile phones register into a network. And then once it's registered, you can stop a drone if you wanted to, stop it from um, taking off or take it down if you needed to. If it was registered, and you can, you can actually uh, follow those drones. But who's to say that there won't be a drone that's created by someone who's not going to comply and register into a network? How do you stop someone from creating a drone like that? I don't know that that's possible. And there were incidents recently where drones were flown very close to some um, government leaders, I think. I don't remember the exact details of them. Thankfully, the drone was harmless and didn't do anything, but you can put anything on those drones and drop things from those drones. And it's surprising that nothing has happened so far, but, and then how, so somebody has, or people have to find solutions to how do you mitigate those potential issues. That'll create jobs. <laughs> Scary, uh, scary uh, things that you have to deal with, but uh, important. Yeah. Uh, training for AI. So, um, if you learn, there's a lot of data science classes that are available in most universities. So you can learn analytics, probability, machine learning algorithms, some of the earlier ones, even neural networks, uh, but support vector machines and decision trees, those are, those are well known and are taught in most universities. But it's good that you mentioned that because yesterday MIT just announced that they are creating a college specifically dedicated to artificial intelligence. So um, it's gonna be uh, the classes will be offered in their different buildings, but they are actually, I think, building a building for this college, and it'll be open in 2022. Um, Northwestern offers a master's degree in artificial intelligence, and Carnegie Mellon announced this year that they're offering a bachelor's degree in artificial intelligence. So I think there are universities that are um, beginning to ramp up and 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 start to offer degrees specifically in artificial intelligence as opposed to offering a computer science degree where you can maybe um, specialize in AI or analytics or data science. It's becoming serious. Uh, and one of the things, some of the things that I haven't um, mentioned, um, if you look at the market or you look at uh, from a world government view, um, China has said that they want to be the leaders in the world in AI. Uh, Vladimir Putin has said, made a statement that whichever country is the leader in AI will be the country of the world. So there's, you know, people in the government know about this. Uh, the World Economic Forum that's held in Davos every year, they have for the last couple of years, they've had workshops and, and talks about artificial intelligence and what the impacts will be on jobs. And they've done studies in that. So people are very well aware that this is happening and, uh, the, and there's an acceleration of uh, improvements in the technology. Even month by month, you hear, you see announcements constantly. company like having like a boot camp service like how Cisco used to have like your boot camp. So it yeah. seemed like you need something more of that sort to keep up with the latest development in it versus a traditional four year university. Yeah, it's it is very challenging. Just just finding people with the 
with the background and experience is hard for companies. I guess it's hard for universities. In general, I've seen um, news about um, cities, municipalities um, wanting to offer more computer science. And we're not talking about AI, but computer science classes and making it required, including Chicago, uh, in grade schools and high schools. And uh, I think the biggest challenge is finding people that can actually teach in those schools because there's not enough people there's there aren't enough people with the um, with the background and skills to do that yeah. right this is Anil from CSU um, thanks Anne for coming here uh, could you talk a little bit more about explainability of AI and the transparency that you touched upon a little bit yeah, if you, so there's different types of machine learning algorithms. Um, if you look at something like a decision tree, which is more of a if-then-else type algorithm, that's easy to explain how you came to the conclusions of, let's take an example of a use case, deci deciding whether you're going to um, approve or not approve a loan, a mortgage for someone. So you could go through a decision tree that looks at people, what was your credit score, what are, you know, different things. And then you come to a conclusion, yes, approve this loan or don't approve this loan. So that's a simple algorithm and that's easy to explain. So that's not an issue. But neuro neural networks, if you're familiar with them, you have layers of neurons, you've got these activation functions and these weights. By the time you get a result going through all these layers, how do you explain how it, how it came to the decision that yes, they're getting a, a loan or no, they're not getting a loan? So um, banks will have potential legal implications if they can't explain why this person got a loan or this person didn't get a loan. Because is it because of some kind of bias or discrimination based on gender or race that this how, you know, and you have to be able to explain this. So that's one of the reasons why it's an issue. I mean, it could also be an issue if, in a self-driving car, why why did it move this way or that way, and you can't explain why it why it it made this decision and then got into an accident versus some other decision. So there's there's some very um, serious implications for why it's important to be able to explain uh, what the AI is doing. And so some algorithms are, because of the nature of how the algorithm works, like decision trees are easier to explain, while others are not. And the ones that are not, we have to figure out some solution for how it can um, explain itself. In the meantime, you know, maybe we could hire uh, forensics analysts who can look through all the data to determine how kind of try to figure out maybe not exactly but try as as closely as it can to figure out why it did the thing that it did or made the decision that it did does that help okay I have a sort of a wrap-up question maybe one person after me but we're going to have uh, we're gonna have lunch soon very soon so to kind of wrap up what I'm hearing, we're talking about this fourth revolution, uh, and we're also talking about a number of different uh, groups of people within our society. So we're talking about how are everybody, how will everybody interact with this, with the the uh, capabilities of the new, the new, the fourth industrial revolution, if you want to call it that. So uh, we are talking exactly some of the questions about short, shorter programs than four-year colleges, for example, and, and then talking about the people who will make decisions about, for example, what's the universe of data that you feed into your, uh, your uh, AI so that you avoid things like, oh, we took these photographs in the morning and he took those photographs in the afternoon and so pattern and background are being confused by the AI. So that's really from, from uh, a, 
a number of different strata or, or groups in society need perhaps different things, but I think the thing in common is that it, we are all going to be required to look at categories differently because categories are morphing. They're changing into each other. So, and even the category of is it a four-year college or is it going to be a six-month educational program that will allow people to, to think differently about, about data itself. And this is something that we'll have in our elementary schools and I th it should break down a lot. And we can all do that is all I, I'm thinking at the moment is that we don't know exactly what the categories will be whatever they are, they're going to morph and change and turn sometimes into their opposites. And, you know, so we can't predict it, but we can make it happen. Uh -huh. uh, that's kind of a wrap up. And I think in this conference as a whole, especially this year, we're seeing the interplay of what a colleague of mine once referred to as, you know, sure we have seven layer protocol stack, but then we have uh, finance, politics, and religion sort of sitting on top of those. And increasingly what we do as engineers and technologists is filtering up to the point that we can't just say, I'm just an engineer and I'm just working on this. So we all have to be part of the educational process. And also there will have to be some kind of decision as to when we'll even allow automate, you know, uh, you know, AI to, to make decisions for us. So sort of uh -huh. thoughts, I don't know if we have any more time for another uh, question or not. We have a last